Homelessness can be the result of a situation that just gets out of control. All of a sudden, you go from a normal life to one where people look at you differently, even though you're the same person inside. We are the same as everybody else, and we'd like people to view us that way. tell you I find it hard to take when people run in circles it's so very very mad world mad world children waiting for the day they feel good happy birthday happy birthday Sit and listen, sit and listen. Went to school and I was very nervous. No one knew me, no one knew me. Hello, teacher, tell me what's my lesson. Look right through me, look right through me. I find it kind of funny, I find it kind of sad The dreams in which I'm dying are the best I've ever had I find it hard to tell you, I find it hard to take When people run in circles, it's so very, very mad world Another name my previous life, but now they call me Hank Homeless. Can't call us homeless anymore, it's um, politically incorrect, it's uh, residentially challenged. But Hank residentially challenged doesn't have quite the same ring to it, does it? Well, when I think back now, uh, I do remember I had business in the, um, in the Supreme Court. It was an equity matter. And I remember walking past this bloke sleeping on the St James steps. It was about nine o'clock there. And oh, look at that poor bastard, you know. And um, three months later, move over, you know, was next to him. I was just so surprised at how, um, how quickly it happened, you know. When I think back now, a lot's got to do with this epileptic seizures that I'm having. Um, you know, I can see now where I um, don't fully understand it, but it, uh, it's just like a breakdown. I've been having these for quite most of my life, I can see now that um, things are going well. 
and all of a sudden um, you get a physical, just a physical breakdown. And that really stuffed everything up, you know. Not understanding what's going on, you think you're going nuts. Um, there's times, and you know, I can remember that um, I've gone months without actually engaging with anybody. No, months, you know. Um, but as you get older, they get longer and deeper, and you don't know what's going on. And that's the um, that's the worst part about it. And if I knew then what I know now, I mean, you could work with it. You know, it's maybe a bit of a handicap, but you can sort of it's okay. You know, you're just going to get. Um, you might have a few days, um, and uh, you'll get over it. At that time, I was sleeping down near the Opera House, outside the Government House. It's quite a nice little spot there. And when you're laying down, it's got a bit of a slope, so you can see people coming up, but they can't see you. Looked like it was raining, so we're just getting the tarp ready for um, in case we needed it. And um, security guards at the Government House, they pulled up and said, look, can't let you put up that tarp. I said, look, we don't give a stuff. You see those guys over there in the million dollar thing? They complain. And if they complain, you know, we have to do something about it, you know. You can't really sleep, you sleep with one eye open. It's, um, I don't think of, so I've had too many nights of a deep sleep. It's like a, um, a light, one eye open, and um, somebody comes within 100 yards and you jump up. You, um, and when you do sleep, and if you've got a sleeping bag, you don't zip it all the way up. You only zip it up the quarter. Um, just for safety reasons, because not only are you lying on the ground, but if you're in a, zipped up in a sleeping bag, you know, you're helpless. Once you've been on the streets for about three months, I think you, you get acclimatised, you get adjusted to it. Um, and I know in my case, I think it was about five months, and I realised then, if I didn't get off the streets then, I'd still be on, I'd never get off. And uh, it's fortunate that uh, I did get off the streets. Um, got into a boarding house. I said to the, um, to the manager, Clary, you know, Clary, I've been in bigger cells than this. That's what I thought, but I didn't, didn't actually say it to him. But, um, you know, you got a bed, a chair, a sink, a microwave, TV. It took a while to adjust because you're, you're sleeping in the same spot every night, you know, you don't have to, oh, where are you going to camp out tonight? Yeah, the first thing that um, I had problems with was um, I couldn't sleep on the, on the mattress. It was too soft, it was, uh, I was used to be a bit of cardboard on the concrete or a bit of plastic on, um, on the grass. Cardboard's no good on grass, but excellent in concrete. It's um, actually like a doona, it's, uh, which I couldn't believe at first, you know, just that little bit of quarter inch cardboard, you know, you get the good cardboard, makes all the difference. Um, took me six months to acclimatise to it, I mean, for about three or four months I was sleeping on the floor. Just actually used uh, the bed as a storage area. One of the disadvantages in a bed setter is that um, most of the things are done laying on the bed. So if you have a cup of coffee, you, know, you have it laying down. If you have a meal, you have it laying down. If you're watching television, you're laying down. So I've actually got a little card table in there so you can actually sit down and have a meal. Or sit down and have a read. Yes, I've got a brick wall. Um, but I've counted just about every brick in the place then, I know it off by heart, um, so I can just about imagine any view I like. Huh? 
I don't like to read before I go to bed because I find that um, wears me out. Yes, if I'm learning something new, complex subject, and like photography, it's not as simple. And I find if I go for a train ride, I can um, pick up a new concept. I find it a lot easier to, to understand sometimes rather than sitting down in your room and trying to bash it into your head. Um, I find train rides relaxing. Uh, I go down to Moss Vale, I might go up to Newcastle, Dungog, and find it just relaxing and takes your mind off it. When I was really, really sick, very difficult walking, uh, very difficult you know, moving around, I'd often just take a train ride um, and just almost doze off in the seats, you know. My first job, when I was 14 and 10 months, when you're allowed to leave school, was in a chicken farm, um, shoveling chicken manure, cleaning out the sheds. And I still remember the first time that he opened the door and there was 30,000 chicks going cheap. That was deafening, that was deafening. Yeah, 1964, my first pay was seven pound ten and six. Uh, still remember that. It came in an envelope and a blue pay slip, and it had tax stamps on it. Um, sixty-three. Hey, sixty-three. Well, actually, I'm um, one hundred and twenty-six because I get two birthdays a year. Um, legal birthday and um, the day I was actually born. Uh, Mum was a refugee and to get on the boat you had to be a month old. So, didn't know when the next boat was coming. So, it could have been six months, eight months, 12 months. So, they just put me birthday forward a couple of weeks. Mum was from Poland, and during the war she was um, forced labour in Germany. And she never spoke about it, there was not, just never, never mentioned. Um, so I was actually born in Germany after the war, but um, from the time she came to Australia, um, there was nothing, never spoke about previous experiences, you know, it just wasn't, just never mentioned, you know. My brother's still around, he's, uh, he's up in Queensland now, we don't get along, uh, it's one of those things, you know. Uh, well, yes, you know, I just resigned to it, you know, so it's um, just the way things, you know, just turned out. Um, as with a lot of, um, with a lot of guys on the streets, it's, um, you'll find that, um, it all breaks down to broken relationships and then uh, depression and self-medication. Um, that'll be a common theme, you know. Just from having everything, like the house and everything, then just sort of renting a place after the divorce, then sort of getting the kids every fortnight, then sort of lost the job. Then just sort of, just ha didn't have no money, couldn't pay the rent, so I had to get sort of get out of there, and then I thought I'll uh, try to find somewhere. So the next minute I'm sleeping in parks. From being brought up and living in the house, to sleeping under the stars. It's quite different actually. Sort of pretty scary at first. There's like, you gotta try and find a blanket sort of sleep on, and. You sort of just got to find a somewhere where a lot of people aren't to sort of sort of camp. So you sort of read shops and everything. Some people sleep around where the shops are, and they get kicked out six o'clock in the morning. 
when the shops open, what security guards come in, sort of, sort of move you on, sort of thing. Then you sort of just got to keep walking around till you find somewhere. So I'm sleeping around of the main car park on top of that at the moment in the open area. Then when it rains, just get under shelter, look, look for a bus shed or something. And sometimes you just get wet. Those are sort of, then you've got to try and dry all the blankets and what clothes you have got. At the moment, just I've got two sets of clothes and a sleeping bag and a swag. And that's my possessions at the moment. I'm an agnostic now. I've been that way since I've been 18, so. Been tested a few times, you know, it's, uh, and that's the way I'll end up, you know. Yeah. I'm agnostic, well, you know, that's either way, you know, you find out when you die, you know. And you do the right thing in life because it is the right thing. Not because, you know, you're trying to please somebody or, you know, you see the common sense in it, you know. When I decide to be an agnostic, um, and then, I mean, there's arguments for, there's arguments against, but you know, we're, we just sit in the middle, so. And being brought up as a Roman Catholic, you know, you had to replace it with something, so. Borrowed it from, um, I don't know, where one of the Eastern, Eastern religion is, you know, what's the purpose of life? The purpose of life is to help others, and if you can't help them, try not to hurt them. Come down on a Tuesday night to wait for the books. Have a glance through the books to see if there's anything um, that you might want to read, any photography books, uh, any books on architecture. I haven't had any on architecture there for a while. Have a cup of tea and um, usually strike up a conversation with one of the volunteers. This is something that you look forward to. The Footpath Library is a service that gives away free books to homeless and disadvantaged people through a mobile service that we have here on the street in Sydney and also through libraries that we install in homeless hostels and community organisations in Sydney, Brisbane and Melbourne. And apart from coming for the books or the tea and coffee, a lot of these people come down just to have a conversation with somebody. There are quite a few homeless services that provide food and shelter for, for their customers, but the Footpath Library is really the only service that provides free new and second-hand books, which are food for the mind and soul. And that is just as important as clothing, food and shelter. And some people have asked me, you know, I mean, these people that line up for the, for the books and the um, coffee or, or a sandwich, how many of them are fed income, you know, are they all fed income? And I just say to myself, look, if you can line up for the food van, you've got an issue you can't deal with, you know, guaranteed. I mean, they say, oh, a lot of them are backpackers. You point them out to me. And I haven't seen any of them. Maybe, there might have been, Maybe one or two, but um, they, they're, not, they're not stayers. Well, one of the things you do learn on the streets is you just don't judge people. I met Hank down at Central, you know what I mean? Uh, so, we used to go to Belmont Park, right, and have cups of tea and things on there, right? And that sort of was a little friendship that started there. As a friend, I'd say I'll give you nine out of 10 as a friend, you know what I mean? Because you'll always get a, de a decent conversation. People on the street, it's hard to get a, a, a conversation, more than 10 minutes, you know, 10 minutes and that's it. But when you find somebody who, who's on the same track as you, your conversation is, is all right, you'll go from there. Oh, well, I had a nice place in Chippendale. It was a three-bedroom house. It was a sandstone place, belonged to a 
Colton Brewery, or it's Tisbury, then Colton Brewery. My father worked for Tisbury and he worked in the vats. We was protective tenants. We paid labour rent, 30, $36, $37 a week, you know what I mean? Then when my mum and dad died, I took over with my older brother. We paid $90 a week. My brother and his girlfriend bought a house, I was there by myself. In 2005, I was just turning 60, and I decided, oh well, time to move on. So I just gave all my furniture away, me ain't doing, you know what I mean? No reason, gave all my furniture away. I got five brothers, they all thought I was a bit silly, you know what I mean? They reckon I'd smoke too much marijuana. No, you lost the plot, you know, give it away. But I just told them, I was doing the same thing all over, every day, going around the club, getting the drunk, coming back, watching the video, fall asleep, you know what I mean? So I decided to go out and see my country and at the same time try and find my daughter. I've been homeless for, since 2005. I've been running around to see as much of my own country as I possibly can, you know what I mean? I've been all over Queensland, uh, right the Cairns, down the coast, Townsville, Mackay, Rockhampton, Brisbane. It took me about 17 months that I come back to here, New South Wales. So when I come back to here, I want to see all my own area, like Palm Beach, Avalon Beach, Narrabeen, uh, all over Miami. I always find somewhere to stay uh, on the beach, under a beach house, or in caves. Same as here, when I'm here, I get on the ferries, I go all on the ferries and stay at the, each wall. Right around the Mossman, and I stay Belmoral Beach, I've stayed on Belmoral Beach for seven weeks, eight weeks. Beautiful Belmoral Beach. Then you do the other area. You go to Kayama. Uh, Kayama, I lived in, um, they got a showground there. They got stables, 12 empty stables, horse stables. Cleaned one out and stayed in there for two months. Waterfall, which I lived in the case of Waterfall. Then come back down to Hawkesbury River, stayed in the Hawkesbury River. And again, in the caves and stayed in there for about six, seven weeks. That seems to be the most I stayed here with, six, seven weeks and then move on. You know what I mean? You get to know the area, bingo, and you're out. I've had a um, heart operation. I've had, um, I've had um, I've cataracts done. So I've gone past my use by date, and I'm sure of that. And um, I was always having problems with, um, I knew always something wrong with the screw loose. I mean, sometimes I'd get, um, things just fall apart. Um, and um, last year I had um, transient ischemic attack, which is short for about 10 minutes stroke and that was scary. Um, and out of, out of that, they found out I had some bit of brain damage. And the neurologist was talking about epileptic seizures. And um, so, having those, um, never drive again. I could never take on any responsibility where um, other people be at risk. So I'm not even a lollipop, not even a lollipop man. So I just don't feel feel that I that I can do that. So my ambition is just to be able to take care of myself. I was in an ambulance in Narrabeen. I got sick. I didn't know. I just couldn't walk straight. I get in an ambulance. I calls an ambulance and he comes and picks me up. He's taking me to the hospital. And he asks me name. Right? He gives him your name, he asks me birth, and what are you? And where do you live? I said, I'm homeless. He said, no, tell me where you live. I said, I'm homeless. And he just looked at me and says, you don't look homeless. I couldn't do it. What does homeless look like? You expect everybody to be, who begs for money, to be homeless, to be look like that? I said, I stayed at Hawkesbury River, which I did, right? And other morning, there'll be at least 70 people get out of the cave, 
go down and have a cold shower, get dressed and get on a train and come in the city to work. It just cannot handle the part of the city life. Say 20% are homeless gives the impression for 100%, right? If people knew that other 80% of the homeless people, the situation, what they're like, you know what I mean? Because now I've got a place at Guildford, right? I've got a brand new unit, brand new furniture, 10 months ago. Now, I've been away for the last eight, nine weeks back on the street because I sit in a unit all by myself Right, and don't communicate with anybody unless I come in here. So when you're in here, you don't want to go back home. You know what I mean? You want to go back on the street again. And that's what a lot of homeless people do. They'll get them a place, they'll be there two, three weeks, and up and out again. You know what I mean? And that's what the majority of them do. I just had good experiences with the coppers, you know, I had no problems with them whatsoever. At one time we were staying at, uh, I think it was Condoleezza Rice was out here, and we just moved into a doorway at um, down Macquarie Street. We are only there a couple of minutes and um, next thing a copper comes in, oh, heading down for the night. Right. He says, uh, what do you normally sleep? He says, uh, over there in the park, but you know, you got it all fenced off, you know. He looks out and he says, mm, can't send you out in the rain. So um, that night we had 15 cop cars and 60 coppers as security. I first met Hank, at, um, it was actually at Wayside Chapel. Um, we did a lot of programs together up there, and um, you know, I loved catching up with him just for that chat because it's a long chat. It's not a short one, it's always a long one. He is a character. Everyone knows Hank. And um, it's good to connect with other people through Hank as well. And that's what you enjoy because, you know, a lot of the people on the street don't do that. You know, don't, don't, don't want to connect that big. But Hank's someone who does. Hmm. I left home at a very young age. Um, I was sexually abused by my father, and it was really rough at home. He was a violent man as well. I wasn't getting any answers from other people. Like, my counsellors at school didn't really care about that side of it, um, because he was a single father looking after three boys. Um, my church was the same. They looked at it the same way. This, you can't be saying that. You know, there's nothing wrong with your father. Because in one way he was showing two faces. He was showing the side of a dating, you know, a father who'd been given three boys to look after by docs. And um, in another way at home it was a different person. Um, so I just left home at the age of 14. And that was kind of temporary, you know, like somewhere between homelessness and, you know, I had no proper home environment anyway. So the boarding house, I lived in a loft in Crystal Street Beach. It was a great, a great place because I was independent. I was away from the threat, and also, yeah, it was just, it was a start of me on my own. Back in 1988, I was diagnosed with depression. This is to do with the abuse, mainly to do with the abuse, and. Um, in 2000, I was actually convicted of an offence. And um, I was charged with blasting as a clerk, stealing from my boss. Um, I stole a lot of money, quite a lot of money. Um, I did a banking at the time and took off to Perth. And they caught me there and brought me back and I faced the charges, pled guilty to everything. But during my pre-census report, they found out that I was actually suffering more than just, and, you know, the depression. Um, and during my jail time, I actually was diagnosed schizophrenic. And it was hard to take. It was hard to go through the fact that you're so mentally ill that you don't have to start me taking this medication. And they had me on medications from then on. It's very harsh stuff. 
it made me avoid life. I slept all the time. You know, I couldn't even do anything. I was inactive and I got up to 126 kilos. You know, and that was the result of the medication. It wasn't until maybe eight years ago that the psychiatrist started to sit down and ask questions, more than they do when you're sick. And they found out that I didn't have schizophrenia at all. It was actually PTSD. It was trauma. You know, learning about your trauma and flashbacks. You know, and I wasn't hearing voices. It was just me remembering what was said to me in the past. You know, and, and recalling it vividly. That's all it was. And um, I got onto the right medication, which got me to be active again. And um, I was able to open my eyes and get up every day and, and actually look forward to a day and cope with it. And since then, I, I at one stage I got off medication. I was off medication for five years. I've only recently gone onto one tablet. And it's just to keep me um, able to cope with going back to work. And because I still get very scared of people and socialising, so it's hard to, to interact without some sort of medication. Violence amongst the homeless is not a thing that uh, I think is a problem at home. Drinking is, um, is if there's any trouble there, they can guarantee there's, there's alcohol involved, you know. Full moon, you know, full moon, they tend to put a floor show on. Yes, when uh, when you get two guys can have a minor argument, um, when alcohol gets involved, you know, it can get pretty ugly fast and nasty. <laughs> Get up in the morning and go to the Matthew Town for breakfast. Then two days a week I've got to go to the employment agency and go there for from 9.30 until 12 and show them that I'm looking for a job. Because I've been unemployed for a while, it makes it even harder to get employed. Just because I've got no tools or anything left. And so just sort of trying to get labouring jobs. And then because you haven't rented a place for a while, then when you go and try and rent somewhere, is you haven't got the references. So it's sort of a vicious circle. I've got two daughters, one's 14, one's 11 now. They're doing very well at school, which is good. They're still with their mother. But I can't sort of see them much because I've got nowhere to take them. And that makes it hard on me, but it makes it hard on them too. But I'm the one that's missing out and seeing them grow up is where I'm trying to get a job and because of the way it is, it just sort of makes it longer and longer apart where we don't see them much. I'm over the bitterness, like, is, I just want to go forward again and just hopefully just work. Like, with all these places out there, it's just hopefully, like, I'm trying to get a house commission place at the moment. Just hopefully the wait list is not too long. Right, I first um, did this trip when I was 11 years old down to Mittagong, a very exclusive boarding school. Very exclusive. Had to be recommended by a magistrate to go there. I had an escort. Man for about, I think he's about 40, 45. And I can remember um, I was sitting bolt upright most of the time. Didn't relax. And um, I do remember him reading the paper. No conversation, he only 
spoke when you were spoken to in those days. The um, spoke about Mittagong Boys Home. It wasn't a good idea to run away because uh, Harry the Hump would get you. Some sort of a boogie man at that stage. I didn't believe it very much at the time. I was very skeptical, but um, to me it was a bit of an adventure. I, I knew roughly where I was going, but uh, it was definitely a long way. The crime in those days was wagging school and running away from home. You're deemed uncontrollable. So they. Um, so they sent you to a reform school. I only started thinking about this, just um, talking to a few guys that had been to boarding schools, expensive boarding schools that their parents had paid fortune for and had a miserable time. I'm hoping to meet this woman, who's a local historian at Mittagong. Apparently she has a lot of archive material uh, and photos of uh, the boys' home complex. You know, there's, um, as I remember, there are about 10 houses, about 30 boys in each house. I was in one of the houses. I think I remember it as number 10. Yeah, not really sure what to expect, uh, but I'm looking forward to it. after all these years, I uh, still recognise the place. It uh, hasn't changed much. It's, um... Oh. Hey. Oh, Leonie, how are you? It's so good to finally meet you yes. after all the conversations mm. that we've had. So you're just back for the day? Just for the day, yeah, just to... Bringing uh, back memories. It does, yeah. It's over 50 years now, it's a long time. Well, we've got seconds. lots and lots of history to fill in those forgotten days mm. that you had here. When we moved to Mittagong in 1954, my mother started working at the hospital. And in those days, I was only a teenager and just thought it was another home on a property, not realising that more than 30,000 children have passed through the homes that are here. And so through the years, I have interviewed hundreds of people that have come to me trying to find out why they came here, understand why mum put them in here, or you know, what the reason was, because they've blanked it totally from their minds. And so uh, the more I got involved, the more I wanted to know. And so after nearly 30 years, I've got an incredible collection. I have lots and lots of questions to ask them to hopefully open their minds, because a lot of them have just cleared it from their brains. They have no idea what they did, what the place was like. And so I've got more than 3,000 photographs taken from the 1890s right through. The cottage that uh, you lived in was one of the first homes mm. and you talked about uh, Mrs Billy Lynx. Yes, Mrs. I, I remember. And their children, so that would bring that back. Yeah, they're, um, the house does and the, the garden, her garden in front of the house, which was out of bounds. But I definitely remember the house and I definitely remember the front of the garden. And. and Yes, oh yeah, ready for bed, ready ready for bed yeah. Check dressing gowns. Yeah, mm -hmm. I remember that. Playing chess, reading books. So, and, uh, you, educationally, you, you did do things other than at school. So, if they had a library and a piano and. Yes. And you played all sorts of games. Well, yeah, mainly, yeah, mainly read, read books, learned to play chess there. Doing this um, gives you something to work towards and it makes you feel better, and it lets others know too that you're not the only one that has had a problem. I don't chase them uh, to come to me, but they hear on the grapevine and they come and they look through the photos, and it's just wonderful to see the smile on their faces as they, oh wow, <laughs> that was the time I was there. And so um, these interviews are really, really worth it. Well, 
actually do a lot of walking on the streets. Um, some because you have to, and some you do a bit of mind mileage to clear your head. Hardly walking these days, but it's more like a shuffle, like a homeless shuffle, you know. It's, um, find I can't keep up with some of the other guys, and uh, sometimes I think I need a walking frame. But uh, find crowded buses and trains um, get very, um, get anxiety attacks sometimes. I can handle the um, blue Mercedes these days, but um, at least I know I can get off the next stop. When I was on the street, I didn't care. Virtually, I was blowing the whole check on gambling. I was blowing it on pokey. What I've learned about my gambling history, which is over 25 years worth, you know, I love the pokey, and I have for many years. I don't use them anymore, but for many years, it was a way of me avoiding life and avoiding people because I'm not very social. And where do you do that? In the back of the bar where the poker machines are, and you can hide from life. Going to a hanging, all I've got to say, I've been framed. That's me in the um, green jacket. It's my sailing days. I had a small sailing boat. I don't have it anymore. It's, it's at the bottom of the harbour. It's a submarine now. We wander up here to St Mary's Cathedral to see the lights of Christmas. Peace is a theme this year. I believe they're artists from the 15th, 16th century. Botticelli, Fettuccini, Titian, whatever. Photography is the latest hobby there. Yeah, you just started fiddling around with it and um, got a camera and I got about four and a half thousand photographs and none of them indexed. I like to take uh, portraits and landscapes. The odd skyscraper building is starting to take a few photos of skyscrapers. It's only a new hobby. I think I start to realise, you know, in a photograph, what's inside shows on the outside. And the difficult thing with, with taking portraiture is if you just take one snap, it's only a single moment in time. And when you're looking at somebody, it's very difficult because you see a moving image. And to, to try and capture it in, in one image is very difficult very difficult, it's, um, though I'm only in the early days. I do a lot of walking at night time around the city. At the moment uh, we're doing a bit of building watching, uh, skyscraper watching. Um, one stage they were just square boxes, 
which I didn't take any notice of, you know, just couldn't be. But starting to get an interest in it, you know, the, at the moment, um, <clears throat> we're right outside the Reserve Bank of Australia, which I can tell you is um, built in 1964, Chicago School. Not, not that I fully understand what the Chicago School is, and uh, met somebody that actually worked on it. Uh, in 64. And on the other side we've got um, Wales Bank which is international style. Can't tell you much about the international style. But... And uh, over behind us we've got Art Deco. And we walk around at night time checking out um, the different buildings and uh, watching out when the um, neon signs go out and uh, not many people around. A lot of us have trouble sleeping um, and it's good exercise and uh, we might do it till about two, three or four in the morning and uh, and then, then wander off. My name's John, I'm 45 years old. I just, hopefully by 50, I'm out of this homeless business. Like, just for my kids' sake. Like, I don't know what else to say, really. It's like, just hopefully it works. Oh well, I sleep on these, and my body is starting to feel it now. You know, when you wake up in the morning, I've always thought myself fit enough, you know what I mean? I, I look alright for 66, I get around, I walk everywhere, I stay on beaches, a lot of beaches, right? And I go to pools. At Cronulla they got one, a rock pool. Uh, Kiama they got one, uh, uh, Avalon's got one. All people get down at half past four or five o'clock. But now I'm starting to feel the twinges these days start, you know what I mean? It's alright if it's, it's warm and hot, you can sleep on the beach, the sand is good. But when we got weather like we've had in the last four or five months, right? You sleep on benches, right? Under cover or something hard, cement. And now it starts getting your twinges in the back. So I think to myself, that's why I pay the rent for where I stay at Guildford, right? Just in case we thought, now I've got to go back now, you know what I mean? So, you know, I, I'm thinking that way, I've got to go back. In 12 months time, I'd love to be working with the, with the um, people of the community. Basically, I don't really want to work for the homeless or the mentally ill because I've already been there and I've already lived that. But I want to work with disability. I want to work in a community with people who are at home, stuck at home, and can't get out of their place. That's the ones, that's the ones that I like to see the laughter from and the smiles. One of the plans that uh, I've got myself a little bicycle um, I figure, well, you know, I can't do too much damage on the roads, you know, but, um, and I just wanted to um, have a drive around New South Wales because I used to be a truck driver and probably been over most of the, the country areas, you know, Bathurst, Mudgee, and, but never seen much of the country, only a little bit of glimpses because, you yeah, you're on a delivery and you're hurrying from one job to the next job and and fast as you can and um, I just like to do it slowly, you know. I mean, I couldn't walk it, but uh, probably with uh, a push bike, I'd probably slow enough, about 10, 20 k's and I can see a few problems there, but um, health-wise, you know, it's always, it always comes back to me, you know, to the health, but... Um, yeah, I hope to do it, and it's more or less like a test, you know, like if I can do that for, for a month and um, probably um, sleep out all over New South Wales somewhere. Just see, see life at a slower pace.
Let's take a walk. We can talk of cabbages and kings, of shoes and ships and homelessness and such peculiar things. And if a bed's more comfortable than sleeping on a mat, why a man's not dressed without a dark gray hat? Just show me around your splendid town, the buildings and the park. If the moon is full, there might be fireworks after dark. You sleep with one eye open, watchful as a cat, head full of dreams and memories under a dark gray hat. Ride the train to ease the pain and let your demons go. Or have a smoke, share a joke with people that you know. Some of them got nothing, they'll give you half of that. You got my friends and a millionaire, and you've a dark gray hair. Time has come, I must at home, that call was from my wife. You cast a spell on those you tell about your checkered life. Thanks for spending time with me, so good to have a chat. I'm awfully glad I met you, see you soon I'll bet you. Never will forget you and your dark gray hat.